So, very good. Yep, and I can see you all. And Hi. I'm now live and recording. So, welcome to this uh, harasses session. And we do have uh, a couple of other people coming in. So, that's good. Um, let me just uh, welcome you today on behalf of Horasis um, and to introduce our uh, panel, speaker panel. Um, we have with us today Greg Crichton, who is the Managing Director of Greater Asian Advisors Limited. He's based in Hong Kong. Amir Hosseini, um, who is co-founder of Curry Up Now in the USA, and he's calling in from the, from the valley, from Silicon Valley. Shuva Mandel, who's uh, the managing partner of Fox Mandel and Associates, and uh, Shuva is calling in from, uh, from Mumbai. Um, and we have uh, Murti Nuni, managing partner of Marshall Funds, uh, who's actually with us from Ho Chi Minh. So a big welcome to the four of you and to any of our, uh, our uh, observers, uh, participants in today's panel which is about how do Asian entrepreneurs pioneer change during COVID-19? Well, it's how, how they did, because uh, we're still, we're still amongst, in, in the middle of COVID-19, um, but uh, we're continuing on nevertheless. Uh, business and entrepreneurship has a, um, never really stops. So COVID had a, has had a lasting impact on entrepreneurship and innovation both in a positive and I would say negative way, although as we all know in the entrepreneurship game, there's no such thing as negative. Um, everything is a learning opportunity. So those who chose to, to pivot during this time um, have succeeded, where those who were hesitant um, will get disrupted. And of course, that is the way. He who hesitates is lost, of course. Um, and we have a couple of questions that have been po posed by Harassus. Um, but before we get to those questions, what I'd like to do is uh, just go to our panel and ask uh, everyone in, um, in order, and I'll just explain who you are, um, to uh, just introduce yourselves and explain the context of why you're, you're on this panel and what you're doing. So, uh, Murti, let's start with you. Thanks, Robert. Uh, my name is Murti Nuni from uh, Marshall Funds. I'm the founder of Marshall Funds, uh, which is basically an investor into sustainable businesses, so both in public market as well as uh, private equity. Uh, so our uh, private equity sustainable investments are into uh, renewable energy, uh, the development of new projects in renewable energy. So my, my home base is London, uh, but uh, during the pandemic for the last 18 months to one year, two years, I've uh, pretty much got stuck in Ho Chi Minh City because the travel is very difficult out of Ho Chi Minh City. They, they blocked the borders a long time ago. As soon as the pandemic started, they, they managed well in that uh, in that way, but uh, uh, they also got hit by the uh, Delta wave during the last two, six months, so we have had a bit of a lockdown. Um, so um, we, we are uh, basically uh, investing into uh, wind solar projects. We have an offshore wind project in, in Vietnam, which uh, I'm currently trying to take it to construction, uh, one if I may go what, a $250 million investment. Um, now, uh, about uh, pandemics, historically pandemics had uh, similar lasting outcomes as we are witnessing today. Uh, for, firstly, there's a uh, uh, you know, loss of life, of, uh, which uh, basically led to uh, shortages of labor, raw materials, manufactured goods. Um, this is needed to be tested in uh, all pandemics before. Uh, the difference now is, uh, this time is uh, massive globalization, which means that the, 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 uh, the pandemic spread too fast and uh, all countries came into, came into lockdown at the same time, uh, which meant that uh, all supply chains came to a halt uh, and uh, uh, containers which went to the USA could not return back. Therefore, that situation continues uh, still. So there, so there is uh, total disruption in uh, travel in uh, uh, goods uh, uh, being shipped from one place to another. Um, the other. The, uh, the second difference compared to the previous pandemics is uh, uh, proactive measures taken by the government. About $14 trillion of stimulus, uh, which meant that there is no shortage of capital compared to before. Uh, so there is a lot of capital sloshing out the, in, in the world. So there is a massive increase in demand as soon as uh, the economy has got restarted. Uh, so we, which, which meant that uh, uh, 
uh, the shortage and there is uh, increase in prices and uh, inflation and that situation uh, continues. Uh, so uh, Asian entrepreneurs and uh, entrepreneurs from the rest of the world have basically found in innovative solutions uh, to, to these uh, uh, problems. Uh, so in our own business, which is uh, uh, the construction of uh, big projects, we found that uh, uh, transportation has been difficult, also especially uh, heavy equipment. Uh, so for the, the foundations for offshore wind uh, require uh, huge steel structures, uh, the black mirror piles, uh, which are like 8 meters wide and uh, 60 meters deep uh, need to be drilled into the ground and these are manufactured and usually manufactured in China or Korea and transported in other countries. Uh, that transport is difficult and uh, uh, also the steel prices have gone up like 70-80 percent which is which is never and never happened before. Uh, so uh, so the entrepreneurs found different solutions so they started using uh, uh, devising uh, new structures, uh, new design. Uh, so instead of steel they started coming up with uh, multiple concrete pilings uh, so the concrete piles uh, can be manufactured locally and uh, they are driven to the ground with stuff for transporting heavy equipment and heavy heavy equipment also require uh, these uh, uh, installation equipment like heavy cranes and uh, and uh, those are also what are difficult to procure during this time uh, so they, this is how uh, you know the entrepreneurs around the world improvised uh, and uh, for, uh, found a better way of uh, coping with uh, Basically, globalization uh, moved into localization, and that's what we are hearing about uh, nowadays. So that uh, uh, chip factories being uh, moved to the USA, uh, both by Samsung and TSMC and uh, the Taiwanese and, and so, so they they need they need to localize it. Every, every company is trying to find localization and uh, local solutions for projects. Thank, you. thank you, thank you. Um, we're now moving to Amir Hosseini. If you could just say a few words about yourself. Sure. Um, yeah, so I'm co-founder of the largest and fastest growing Indian restaurant chain in the USA. Um, you know, firsthand, we've dealt with the ramifications of COVID from, you know, disruption of service, government lockdown. Um, and these days, supply chain. Uh, Aside from my work in my own company, I, I spend a lot of time working with other founders um, and CEOs in, in other verticals, specifically to small and medium sized business. And uh, ultimately, we all have the same story. You have to you have to you have to make the change and you have to play with with whatever the rules are of today. Um, and it's just, you know, exciting to be able to navigate through these opportunities um, and challenges and you know ultimately you want you want your passion to be successful and so this is probably why i'm here today to talk a little bit about those experiences thank you Amy. um and now uh greg just as a brief introduction yeah hi um so my background's mostly in an industry that i'm not going to talk about uh it's insurance uh, which uh, has been for many years and uh they're the ones who are usually dragging, dragged, kicking and screaming into change. But that's the most important thing right now is, is change. And the pandemic has, has brought about change in a much more rapid way than we would have ever anticipated before. Uh, so, yeah, insurers are having to change. And they're all talking about digitization. Uh, but uh, there's, there's nothing that I see there that is really, really innovative outside of the insure tech space. And I'm actually working with, with a new insure tech company as well that uh, are, are actually, if they can break through there, they're actually going to change one part of the industry. And so, uh, I, but I don't really want to focus too much on that. Uh, actually, I thought it'd be interesting just to, to mention that, that it's a tale of two cities, really. You've got... Um, Last year in the UK, 90% of startups failed uh, and disappeared. On the other hand, um, so far this year, what we've been able to see is that there are more startups valued at more than 10 billion US dollars, and they've been formed in 2021. We've now got something, it's a new term, uh, which I've only recently heard. Uh, we've now got decacorns, and uh, the decacorns... Um, are the ones that are that are, are valued now at at a hundred billion, and uh, there are thirty of those, and that's double from 2020. So so there's a lot of change taking place, 
and uh, and so why am I on this panel? Uh, because um, trying to follow some of that change, I've been investing in a number of uh, young startups, and in, uh, and I'll talk later on about the the acronym uh, myself and the the various parts that that make that up. Um, but uh, by the same token, uh, what I've seen with um, with some of the things that I've invested in, which you haven't been able to change, uh, one of them is in in Vietnam. Uh, in the travel industry. It's gone completely kaput. Uh, another one uh, has been completely uh, decimated by the change of regulation in Vietnam, brought about by COVID uh, because um, credit defaulters in, in Vietnam uh, no longer can be uh, pursued during the, the COVID pandemic. Um, on the other hand, you've got uh, you've got a company that I, I unfortunately I had nothing to do with, but it's worth mentioning a company called Pronetics, which is out of Hong Kong. Um, they're actually on on Nasdaq now. You can see them on PRE on Nasdaq, and uh, they they're valued at uh, 1.7 billion. But what did they do to get there? Uh, they provided COVID testing kits. So you would have heard about them, but for the uh, but for the pandemic, and they've just rocketed up in terms of of uh, overall recognition. Um, so I can talk some more about those sort of things in, in due course. Thank you, Greg. Um, and uh, now to Shuba. Hi, I'm. My name is Shuba Mandel. I'm part of a very old law firm. Uh, started about 125 years back in 1896. I'm the fourth generation entrepreneur and I joined the firm in 1983 and expanded the operation of the firm in India. The firm, the, I specialize mainly in corporate m and and assist a lot of family businesses advisory work. I advise a lot of young entrepreneurs who are expanding in India and US as as you know, these are the two places where a lot of things are happening with the COVID changing. I thought this panel, I would like to express my views, how they have taken it forward. That's all. Never Thank you so much. Um, I'm now going to ask a, a, a couple of questions um, that were, uh, as I said, were posited by, um, by Harassus. Um, and... Um, Firstly, starting with um, Amir, if you could, if I could ask you um, how to transform tough economic challenges into entrepreneurial opportunities. You know, this, this is what is, um, and what, yeah, basically what, from your point of view, what um, transformations have you seen through COVID? Yeah, I, I think this is a great topic to discuss. Uh, I, I mean, it, it really depends on which which industry you're in, uh, but ultimately they're all similar stories, right? Yeah. I think I think in our case, um, for me specifically, in what I've seen, you know, if if you're selling a product and that industry is no longer in a position to um, to purchase that product, specifically like in SaaS um, software. Um, I, I think one of the key things is you have to start looking around as to as to who else can buy, right? I mean, ultimately, uh, you know, when you're in business, you're selling a product or you're selling a service. So you have to kind of think outside of the box uh, and, and figure out whether or not you can make a pivot to another industry. Can you can your solution solve someone else's problem? Um, I think also if if you're focused on the consumer side, one of one of the largest issues. Uh, that you're facing specifically in retail because we have a huge change in how in how retail um, has transformed us uh, and in my case specific to food uh, you have to look at what your options are how are you going to be able how are you going to get your product out uh, how are you going to you know project supply chain items coming in uh, today's you know six months ago there were concerns of of, of government you know shutting down you know, the ability for, for something as simple as dine-in customers, right? A year ago, that just wasn't even allowed here in California. It's probably one of the most stringent um, uh, COVID requirements to date. Uh, but you look, you know, 
you leverage what, what you have available here. And in this case, it could be delivery. Um, it could be just, you know, uh, supporting other communities. Uh, there, there's just so many ways to, to, to leverage your brand or, or leverage your, your infrastructure uh, to make a change. Uh, now, I think as a founder, you have to have the personality, you have to have the grit to go out there and grind it out and, and find the way to succeed, right? You have companies that, you know, they shut their doors because they, you know, you just don't know what you're going to do. You don't know how you're going you're gonna to put your fir- first foot forward. And you have other companies that they just go out there and, and they figure it out and, and you find a way. Um, and, and you just don't let circumstances that you can't control determine your destiny. Um, it, so I, I, th- I think in my part, it, it, you know, it, it's a little bit about who the founders are, who, who the team is, whether or not you're, you're able to, to lean in and, and leverage uh, the, these circumstances that you're in and, and find something good out of it. And I think we have a lot of stories today where we're seeing that, uh, where, where the change, you know, whatever changes were required have happened or they're happening. And we're getting some good success stories. There's obviously ones that, that don't work out. Um, but, but ultimately it's about the team and the founding and the founding group. They have to just work through it. So I hope that answers the first part of your question. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much. Mir. Uh, Shuba, any examples that you can, um, share with us in terms of entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial pivots during yeah, COVID? I think, I think the, uh, thanks Deborah, for the introduction. I think the, as early speaker said, I think I agree with him that the uh, level of impact in the pandemic depends largely on the nature of business. If it is something that could be shifted online, it tried and prosper. But if it is a tangible offering, the operation took a hit. Uh, the example of Lime, uh, e-scooter startup lost about 80% of its value after the pandemic. They valued at two point. 4 billion before last year and now it is just half a billion just an example of that yeah go ahead have you got any positive examples <laughs> <laughs> i think positives uh, as you see that a uh, lot of educational institutes we see have transformed quite a lot from mm-hmm. offline to online mm-hmm. and uh, some of the indian tech firms have really boomed and they have become the unicorns in India, and one of them is uh, an academy uh, online platform, which is doing very well. So the the theme, the thread through all of that, of course, is digital, is it not? Yes, um, digital is a key, and and encompassing, embracing digital in a way that, uh, or, or not in a way that hasn't been done before, but um, but definitely uh, in terms of uh, greater uptake and, and and capability in the digital realm. Um, Greg, there's a question here, but I actually want to pick up on something that you talked about before, which was um, an acronym called myself. What, what's that about? Hmm. Yeah, okay. Myself is, uh, is covering a number of areas. It's me and, and you, all of you. Uh, and it covers the S is for sustainability. The E is for education, the L is for logistics, and the F is for food security. So I can see that my other panelists have talked in a couple of those areas already. So I can I can uh, expand on that. But but before I go into that into that acronym, just uh, as one other example of something when we are saying it's all digitization, mm-hmm. uh, to to use an example of a good friend of mine who was already online. And he had an online uh, business called Urban Hire, which was an employment agency, effectively. And uh, and in the opposite of the normal trend of what you would expect, he has found difficulties in making that business sustainable in the pandemic. I guess it's because uh, a lot of people are working from home, a lot of people are out of jobs, uh, etc. So what he's actually done is gone offline. And uh, his uh, company is really going extremely well offline by uh, they're doing uh, 
athletic fields where they put down the surface of athletic tracks, etc. And of course, a lot of people are wanting to get outdoors nowadays. So a lot of governments are trying to to build facilities. So they provide the, the seating, they provide the track, they provide all of those sort of things. So it's an interesting, different example to the, to the ones that, that otherwise we would, we'd be giving. So to go back to the uh, the myself example. So, of course, sustainability, we're going to talk about sustainability on anything we do nowadays, and that runs across the whole the whole gamut of, of everything that we're doing. If you're not doing something sustainable, then you may as well go home to bed. Uh, but uh, but when we when we talk about something like education, which was which was just mentioned. Um, so I've invested in a, in a company that uh, is teaching data science called Algorithma. And uh, and so those guys, uh, young guys in their in their early thirties, um, they were teaching face to face, and they were happily expanding uh, throughout. This is this one's in Indonesia, so they were happily expanding throughout Indonesia, with uh, a lot of facilities being set up in various towns in Indonesia. Interestingly, uh, the meeting in Singapore pre-COVID where I was telling these guys, you know, you guys have got to go online. You've got to actually do this because other people are going to come and eat your lunch if you've got a good product. Um, and at that time, they were, no, no, we don't do that. But with COVID, they had no choice. So they have gone online. They are teaching online now. They have gone through a period where uh, it looked as though the company was possibly even going to go under. But by the end of the end of 2020, that turned it around and made a 250,000 US dollar profit. Now, um, I mean, this is not a unicorn or anything like that. But this is this is a real world example mm. of where these guys have pivoted positively and been able to do a sustainable business. So, so that's one in the education field. Um, in the in the logistics field, another one that I've invested in. Um, where this is a Singaporean company, and uh, and these guys, uh, they they had some technology um, uh, pre-COVID, uh, and actually another Chinese company that's um, oh, I think Greg, you've frozen. Have we lost you? Yes, we have. Uh, Greg will return. Um, so let's go to the next question that I'd be very interested. Oh, Greg, I'm going to keep, you gonna keep you <laughs> Sorry, gonna, you, keeping us on our toes. Frozen, <laughs> yeah, frozen disappeared, but you're back. So okay, so I, I froze, right? So, so you're, up, you're up to logistics. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so what these guys, what these guys have done is they've they've created um, a, 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 an online delivery. Uh, service. So you, you talk about companies like Grab uh, in, in Asia and, and other similar companies, Gojek and all those sort of companies. So these guys are very rapidly becoming the biggest company in Singapore for all of those deliveries and they're starting to um, go out of Singapore and, uh, and do global deliveries. Just within the last few weeks they've teamed up with another international organisation to do global deliveries. So so again, this is this. By the way, they they call this product Via Move, uh, and the company is Viagu. So again, you can see uh, these guys really, really benefiting from uh, what I think I, I heard um, mentioned earlier on. Uh, I think it was Morty who mentioned about all the logistics problems that, that are being suffered. And there's no doubt that there are many, many logistics problems. Uh, and the last one is is in food security, and, uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm going to put in a plug here for my son, who's who's got a uh, who's got a startup, and they're just about to launch in in the US. They're already launched in Hong Kong and and in uh, Singapore, and they are doing an alternative meat product, plant based, uh, where they have taken uh, the jackfruit and they are now producing. Uh, pork products, and there are a number of restaurants already. And uh, and uh, if they launch correctly in the US, uh, as it looks pretty positive at the moment from their latest raise, 
then uh, they're going to have a fairly large presence in the US. So, so I think uh, larger than that, there's another company called Just Egg, which is already in, in the US, and I mean, may have heard of them. These guys are, are taking the, uh, the, the plant-based egg market by storm. They have 7% of market already in the US, uh, and um, places like Walmart, etc., cetera, are, are already stocking their product. And uh, they're looking at a $3 billion valuation uh, for a listing early on uh, next year. So when you talk about companies like my son's company, Karana, or, or like Just Egg, these are the guys that are building food security in a very new way than uh, what has been the traditional way. And, and the big guys in the room are, are Impossible and Beyond Meat, uh, whom you probably already know about. And I, I, think, I think all of that plant-based area is so hot and building so much that... Uh, that we're going to see a, a real shift in terms of, of the way that we can build food security. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. I have, I have a question that was sort of posed by, by Harassus as well, but, um, it, and, but it's one that fascinates me uh, professionally and personally, and that is, can entrepreneurship be taught? And I'm going to ask all four of you to give me a, a kind of view on that, starting with you, Murthy, um, do you think entrepreneurship can be taught? Uh, yeah, I, I actually went to uh, I am of the body in India a uh, long time ago at the India school, right? So, so we, we had an entrepreneurship uh, course which was newly started and it was very popular. Uh, I could not get into it because there was too much demand, <laughs> but probably I was the best entrepreneur in my class. <laughs> and uh, all the guys who had taken the entrepreneurship course probably did not even start up. So, <laughs> so yeah. I, uh, I'm not sure if uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurship uh, really requires any teaching <laughs> and that uh, you, you're finding that uh, a, a lot of uh, you know, kids in the USA are uh, dropouts uh, starting companies and uh, becoming very, very successful. Uh, so uh, to, to some extent, I mean, entrepreneurship uh, you know, uh, is self-taught. Uh, it's 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 there's a lot of gut involved. There's a lot of great and uh, risk-taking ability, right? Uh, but so, so some of these things have have become better uh, of late compared to when I actually started business. Uh, when I started business, there there was no capital available, right? Easily available. So you you have to basically boots, bootstrap it, uh, run with your own money. Uh, whereas uh, today, family. yeah, risk appetite is massive. Uh, you know, uh, it's startup companies and they get funded, uh, it doesn't matter what age they are, if they have a, a brilliant, brilliant idea which looks uh, sexy, so, such as uh, cryptocurrencies or anything to do with, the, with these uh, newfangled uh, names, uh, they get funded. Uh, and right now, risk appetite is absolutely, absolutely at the high. There is uh, so much of money floating around in the, in the world. Uh, they are prepared to uh, fund all kinds of companies. Uh, risk appetite in the stock market is massive. Valuations are huge. Uh, uh, so because of huge valuations, uh, the companies are happy to fund. So uh, the environment currently uh, helps a lot of a lot of uh, entrepreneurs to, to come into the field and to try out their new ideas. You think everyone's just chasing the dollar, chasing the yeah. unicorn? Um, Shuva, I think yeah, I I agree with uh, both the on this issue, but the I feel that entrepreneurship is something which has to be inborn to some extent. But nowadays, uh, there are a lot of new courses which try to guide you, but with the I don't think it really matters if you have a great idea and you are able to scale it up, that's the key. Uh, and now money is flowing, as Murthy said, that the money is just flowing in. Uh, recently, a uh, lot of Bitcoins and others are trying to give funding to that. So if these are things which is going to happen, uh, if you have a great idea and you are able to visualize the growth which is going to happen, they will succeed. I think that's what I wanted to take away. Thank you, Greg. Do you think it, it, entrepreneurship can be taught? I think it's a yes and no answer. Uh, uh, they are uh, th these individuals who are able to to take on a challenge like this 
uh, often it's innate, but there are many of them who go out there and take on the challenge and still fail. And so what, what happens there is you get mentors and you get advisors. And the mentors and advisors become very, very important to a lot of these guys in startups. Uh, and if they, if they listen to these guys, then uh, they, they can take a lot of uh, knowledge away that it benefits them because they have the initial idea. But how do you crystallize that initial mm-hmm. idea and build on it to something that really is sustainable? And, and to go back to something that I mentioned before, that the Phonetics guys out of Hong Kong. So the guy who's who's heading that up is a guy called Danny Young, and uh, and he said um, that what you have to have is three things: passion, creativity, and most importantly, humility. And with the humility means that you listen to other people, like your mentors and like your your advisors, and and I'll I'll put in one more plug before I shut up. Uh, the there's uh, on Spotify a good friend of mine has has done a series, which is called Wisdom Archiver, and what he's done is uh, and and this guy this guy is one of the one of the the guys um, in that company I mentioned the one teaching data science, and he has uh, he's developed this series as advice for young entrepreneurs. Uh, and so there's been a, a number of people, uh, including some <coughs> of mine, who have uh, given basically their time in speaking what they think they can pass on as their wisdom for young entrepreneurs. So it's, um, it's a, really good, uh, a really good thing for, for young guys to listen to. So it's a yes and no answer. Thank you, Greg. And before I go to you, Amir, I just uh, would like to also say it's, a, it's an interesting thing from my uh, experience. I'm very involved in the advisory board um, uh, universe, uh, which is growing. And the number of advisory boards for startups that have, uh, have been developed are fantastic and a great way to bring in um, expertise that you perhaps don't have in the business. And, you know, frankly, there are so many people out there that would, who are looking to mentor and guide. So I think that the, um, the way of doing that to get to, to you know, to provide uh, advisory, advisory boards helps you road test ideas. Um, and, uh, and particularly with the framework created by the advisory board centre. So that's a plug for them. Um, Amir, do you think education can be taught? You know, I, I think, I think you. Uh, as, sorry, entrepreneurship can be. Taught. I, I think, I think you know, as an entrepreneur, you have that spirit where you want to take some, like you want to own your own destiny, right? Um, and that can't be taught. But how to get there can be taught. Um, you know, going through someone else's firsthand experiences can be value. Sometimes it can be jaded, but there could be a lot of value there as to what can work and what won't work and how you should structure your organization. Uh, I think advisors for young founders, young entrepreneurs, it, it, it brings um, a lot of maturity at times where, where, you know, sometimes you, you give a, you know, 22 year old kid, $20 million, the maturity may not be there or, you know, um, right away to to uh, strategize correctly so i think there's a lot of a lot of um you know positivity and mentorship personally for me uh, i'm one of those stories college dropout ended up finding a good a good a good set of mentors um and you know i've i've grown a company it's a national company i've started several other companies in covid so talk about the covid pivot you know um, and, and I, I think for me, what's, what's allowed me to get to where I'm at today is mentorship. And, you know, uh, I, I think it's so valuable. And today I, that's one of the reasons why I pay it forward because it's, it's done so much for me. Uh, I think, I think, uh, in terms of, you know, when it comes to industry and education, I don't think education can give you that, that, that need, that need of experience <clears throat> in industry. Um, but I think, you know, something like corporate finance would be very valuable. 
uh, courses of that nature, but you're not going to get taught how to be an entrepreneur. You either have it in you or you don't. And that's, that's what it boils down to. So. Thank you. That That's great. Um, there's a, obviously a, a, a several themes running through everything that all of you uh, have said and, and all of you agree. So that must be the way forward. Uh, we've got uh, a couple of people in the in the group. Well, it has to be the way forward. Um, and uh, we've got a couple of people in the group. Are there any questions from you that you'd like to ask the panel? Because we've got about eight minutes left. If you can, just grab the microphone uh, icon. No, nothing. Okay, let's continue to talk amongst ourselves. No, no, sorry. Oh, someone, I mean, someone, someone, sorry has... someone wants surrender, wants some some render. Uh, Mr. Kumar wants the mic. Please allow that. Go ahead. Hi. Yeah, my Hi. name is Samrendra. I'm also an entrepreneur, and obviously, I'm listening very keenly to all all the entrepreneurs, and and of course, I endorse most of the things what they say. I just wanted to understand. You know, is there a is what the the views of the panel on how to scale up uh, startups which are not purely digital or which are not purely in the numbers or the you know large consumer base or something, you know. So how do you scale these kind of startups or which are a mix of I think uh, product plus service startups? So any thoughts on that? Well, who who do you direct the question to? Oh, I think all of them are capable of answering this. Oh. But okay. Amit can take that. Amit can take Amit, that. You, sure. You can, um, Amit can take that, you know, so. You know, I, I think the first question is one, is the company or the organization generating some sort of sales, right? Or like, have you found product market fit, right? Because ultimately, if you're in business, you're in business to solve a problem. And I think that's one of the key things with successful startups. You know, the organization, the organization starts to solve a problem. Um, and it could be any problem. It could be a food shortage problem. It could be just feeding people. It could be, you know, stocking items that are deliverables or wearables, right? So we're looking to solve a problem. If the company can solve a problem and you feel confident about that and you're able to generate sales, then you have to lean into that avenue that's producing some sales for you to, to figure out where that peak is going to be. Um, and if you can, if you have a lot of runway to that peak, then you have to keep going and not pivot away from that that sales target, right? Uh, if you're selling the small and medium businesses, you have to lean in that until you've saturated the whole market. If you're, you know, if you're, you know, leaning towards a gig economy, well, how are you servicing them? Um, but but I think for me, it's just a matter of uh, leaning into what's working and pushing it as far as it goes. And if you feel like it's saturated. Then find the next, the next closest uh, vertical, and move into that vertical next. Um, but don't take the foot off the gas if you're seeing some success. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. I, I love that getting into the exploring the adjacencies, and you know what, what else can you do? You know something similar. Yeah. Thank so like, you. Yeah, I think maybe I just I just add on that because yes, I, please, I, totally, I totally agree with what Amir just said, and the difference between the the digital entrepreneurs and startups uh, and the the ones, if I can put it, in the real world, um, is the uh, <laughs> expectation of the future on the digitization, and with m massive revenue projections in many cases, but with uh, a, a huge lag time before you're starting to get revenue. Uh, whereas with the type of business that Amir is doing or, or was the one I talked about earlier on, um, you it, what, uh, what your investors want to see is your revenue. They want to see that you have actual revenue and they want to see what your revenue stream is and that those projections are sustainable projections. So I totally agree with what Amir said. It has to grow too, right? Like you have to spend a little bit of money and it has to be sustainable growth. You can't burn a ton of cash and in, 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 in the ROI doesn't make sense. So as long as you're seeing sustainability and you can see that point to where it's going to make it, then just keep pushing on it. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? <laughs> Any other questions? 
No. Okay. I have a question for you all. We have literally three minutes left. Um, do do you think that there is? Oh, I'm, ask, I'm not sure I'm asking this question correctly, but do you think there is a difference between Asian and um, Asian entrepreneurs and anyone else around the world? And uh, Shubha, I'm going to ask you that question. I personally feel there is no difference as such, but in Asia, because you have a lot of people there, some of sometimes the startups are able to use consumers as a base to try it out and scaling up becomes easier. But actually, there is no not really much difference between an Asian entrepreneur or an international entrepreneur because you have to face the same problems. You need to go take funding. You have to have an idea. You need guidance. You need to do the everything. So I I really don't agree with the view that entrepreneurs in Asia is quite different from others. That's cool. I, I feel the same way. Murthy, what about you? Um, you, you know, basically, in, in Asia, you're operating in an environment which is not very structured like the West. So you you have to find your own solutions for everything, uh, and uh, also you find that uh, uh, there are a lot of entrepreneurs in Asia. There, you know, the risking ability is a lot higher. Uh, it's uh, probably also because uh, you, you know you, uh, so some people have very limited options, and uh, uh, the only uh, only way for them to get started in life is to start their own company. Uh, because the job opportunities are much less, especially at uh, the junior level and uh, uh, if, if they didn't go to a good university or they don't have a proper college degree, uh, they're probably better off first uh, starting up their own company uh, rather than uh, working for somebody. Uh, and uh, also the other difference is uh, the uh, salary levels uh, in Asia tend to be much lower uh, compared to the US uh, or, or you, you know, compared to the West for that matter. Uh, so um, the, the reason to stay, if, if, if you are already very comparable, then uh, you know, why do you want to even start up? So you might as well work for a big company and uh, get, get your options and uh, get a big salary. Uh, uh, as opposed to Asia, where the salary levels are much much lower, so you are uh, better off trying to you know, try your luck in entrepreneurship so that you have a better chance in life. <laughs> okay. Thank you. One literally last comment from each of you. I would like to ask you, what is the best book you've read recently? So, uh, Murphy, start with you. Just a just a title. Um, yeah. So, the books about uh, pa pandemics, uh, how uh, you know uh, the the past pandemics were, what they have taught about how the world is evolving just after the pandemic. So that's the, that's something which I found uh, very interesting. You have, do you have a book title? Uh, no, I can't recall any title at the moment. No, no, no. Sorry, I've just I've just <laughs> logged this at you, and none of you prepared. But um, so, but, I, but you I have one for you, well. <laughs> uh, Greg. Uh, it's a book called Mentoring in Reverse. Mentoring in rever in reverse. And recommended. Yes, uh, what it means in a nutshell is. Throw away the old notion that because you're the elder person, you can be the teacher. Take on board the notion that it's a two-way street. The young yep. person teaches the older person, just as the same works two ways. Yes, there's a group called the Modern Elder Academy um, that is actually uh, suggesting that as well. So uh, that's a book that's going to be on my list. So thank you, Greg. Um, Shuva. No, I don't recollect. I was trying to recollect, but I don't recollect anyone, any name, book as such. Yeah, who has time? Um, and Amir. You know, I highly recommend uh, this book. I just finished it maybe a few weeks ago. It's called The, the Leadership Challenge by uh, Barry Posner and James Kuzis, I believe. Um, and this book really highlights traits that leaders, uh, you know, may practice or may not practice as much uh, and really defines, you know, good qualities in leadership. Uh, so anybody on the entrepreneurial side who, um, 
who has, you know, teammates or employees that work for them, I, I highly recommend it. Um, it's, it's got some really good uh, content in there for sure. Excellent. Well, thank you all. This is our time is up unless there's any questions from the floor. If there are, just grab the mic icon and, uh, and I'll give you a second for that. And I don't think there is, although I just must do a shout out to Eden Chu who has been on this call since the very beginning and has stuck with us. So thank you very much. Um, and um, really a fantastic uh, session. I thank you guys um, wonderfully um, for being with me and uh, on this uh, journey uh, for the last 45 minutes. And I hope that um, I wish you well in all of your endeavors. Uh, and thank you very, very much indeed for, for being with us today. Um, and a big round of applause from me to the four of you. So thank you. Thanks, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop the streaming now. Thank, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Great, great to have been with you. Thank you. Thank you.